At GitLab, we're innovating together. Partnerships are important to complement our capabilities. I'll be highlighting several technology partners today and tomorrow. The first partner I'd like to showcase is Anchor, and I'd like to thank them for their sponsorship of this year's Commit User Conference. Be sure to check out their demo as well and learn how Anchor complements GitLab capabilities to provide solutions to U.S. federal customers and many others. Hayden Smith and James Peterson with Anchor are going to share DevSecOps lessons learned from working with a large federal agency that can be applied to any organization. Welcome, Anchor. Hi, everyone. Welcome to our session today on how DevSecOps lessons from the DoD can help any organization. We'll be talking to you today. Uh, it's me and my friend James. Uh, I'm Hayden. I'm a senior DevSecOps engineer with Anchor and handle a lot of projects alongside James in the public sector business. Yeah, and I'm James Peterson. I'm also a senior DevSecOps engineer at Anchor. Um, I spent the last year um, doing SRE work with Platform One, specifically on the Iron Bank project, um, supporting Anchor as well as some other um, facets of their DevSecOps platform. Today on our agenda, we're going to be briefly going over the challenges that the DoD faced moving forward. And I believe a lot of these challenges will be familiar to your organization. Um, if you haven't seen these challenges before, the odds are you will see them, you know, uh, in the near future. Uh, we'll be talking about the DoD best practices and solutions we have for these challenges, as well as uh, some elements of a strong security foundation that can be adopted by your organization. So just talking about the DoD and DevSecOps, Anchor exists for these three main use cases, and they're being used all over the DoD right now. So. Uh, you know, sometimes people are going out and building an image marketplace. So they're taking containerized applications and building a secure marketplace and want to validate that these images and containers are up to a certain security and compliance standard. We also exist to secure products and applications. So to continuously protect those internal applications your teams are building uh, from security risk, whether it be external or internal. Uh, also ensuring security and compliance of the software you deliver. So for their, uh, you know, the DOD, this is very, very important because they have such a strong compliance baseline that they have to meet. Uh, but you could quickly see how this can correlate to any industry or any vertical here. Today, we'll also be introducing Platform One as a case study. Uh, again, a lot of these challenges are very broad, uh, but a lot of them were uh, experienced firsthand by both myself and James uh, as we worked on Platform One. So we'll be referencing Platform One throughout the pr presentation. Platform One allows users to adopt uh, DevSecOps and serve as, it serves as a DevSecOps software factory uh, for the entire Department of Defense. All right, so challenge number one. Uh, this is something that's been in the news quite a bit lately, which is software supply chain attacks. Whether it's SolarWinds, CodeCov, uh, Kaseya was a recent one, so that one happened just like a week or two ago. Um, all these attacks are done by you know very persistent threat actors that are very committed, you know, and and very creative in how they execute these attacks. So we're seeing this. These attacks shift further and further to the left, um, penetrating further down in the software supply chain where they can then spread quicker into more organizations uh, very easily, right? So um, this is something that's going to continue to persist. Um, and, and when we talk about how this relates to the DOD, this is something that is definitely front of mind because the types of actors that are behind these attacks are the same kinds of actors that uh, we have to protect ourselves against, right? Not only private sector, but also public sector as well. Um, and these are actors, you know, they're, they're familiar with. So um, this is definitely a type of attack that is very concerning and something that we had to take on as a challenge uh, when we talk about, you know, the DOD and all of our uh, kind of public sector business out there. In our recent report, Anchor went out and published uh, our own report uh, we found that 64% of enterprises were in impacted by a software supply chain attack in the last year, right? And based on what some of those logos we saw on the previous slide, 
right? Uh, CodeCov, SolarWinds, Kaseya. Uh, CodeCov is an interesting one because it specifically deals with, you know, Docker files and images and abusing images and things like that. And then of those, you know, software supply chain attacks in the last 12 months, uh, we determined, you know, of those re respondents, 15% said they had a significant impact, 20% said they had a moderate impact, around 30% uh, with a minor impact. So that's really important. And you could go grab that report down from, from our website and take a deeper dive in that. So our second challenge at the DOD is also that in, in, in the public sector in general is that we're dealing a lot with containerized technology, right? So packaging software has become easier than ever uh, with the onset of containers. Um, that's great because you can package up all your application code, everything that, that application needs to run, right? So your licenses, uh, your code artifacts, um, anything like that. Uh, but they're also a huge security risk because you have so many different files, uh, so many different dependencies, packages, uh, secrets being pulled in. Um, so you need a way to look inside that and, and detect those security issues that and compliance issues that may be um, present in that containerized uh, component. So when you look at combining challenges one and two and really layering that on top of each other, you get this super oversimplified version, right? So on the right-hand side of your screen, you have your cloud native uh, application. So each of those boxes represents a container, right? Um, specifically, if we're talking about uh, a modern kind of application, you're typically gonna have more than one container that that application needs to run. And each of those kind of containers um, is sourced and built in a different way, right? So you have your vendors, your public repos, your your private repos that are all being pulled from in order to contribute co code and pull code in to uh, create that image, right? That will eventually go on and be a running container. But each of those public repos, private repos, or that vendor may have a different standard on what they you know, think security and compliance means for building secure software. But then, you know, when we oversimplify it, uh, <laughs> it, it gets even crazier, right? So you look at that vendor, uh, where you source from, or that public repo you pulled from, and they may be pulling, you know, down or upstream from somewhere else, right? And they may have a different standard on security and compliance with their software, which can further complicate the issue. So you need to introduce a choke point there where you can then inspect that software, make sure it's up to up to standard and up to par with your security and compliance baselines, uh, check for different threats and attacks and things like that uh, within your software before you, you know, have that final application you see there on your right. And then when we talk about platform one and, and the DOD, uh, now our, our third challenge is really automating this. So we wanna protect against so software supply chain attacks. We want to adopt and heavily use containerized and other cloud native technologies, but we wanna do this in a fully automated process. So that way we could speed up delivery of you know software updates, new software tooling uh, to the warfighter, right? So when you take a look at kind of the modern CICD process, you have all those different workloads that, that you're handling, and then you have your tool chain below that. So you have all your uh, tools that are a part of, of handling those workloads, right? So you have your sourcing, develop, build, test, deploy, and run stage. And at each of these stages, there's always a new attack that can occur, right? So um, we have four listed, but you know, for each of those four, there's probably 10 to 15 that you could easily uh, you know, add to each box. So, that's something that's really important to keep in mind is that there's really a ton of attacks that could introduce themselves at any port at point in this automation process, whether it's an insider attack by someone that is you know, trusted um, or whether it's a simple typo squatting attack from something that is upstream, right? Um, say you're pulling in a different uh, package or dependency that is vulnerable. Um, that's something you definitely want to uh, monitor for. And then taking a look at challenge number three uh, even further uh, and digging into kind of what we were thinking about at Platform One as we started to think about, you know, how do we protect ourselves from software supply chain attacks? How do we automate this whole flow and automate, you know, um, you know, contributing containerized technology and using containerized technology? 
um, you know, you have to ask yourself important questions, right? So who do we trust? Uh, what components of software should we trust? How do we go about inspecting the software or things like that? Who owns what? So who's going to own the security model within this? That's part of our part of DevSecOps, right, is actually reestablishing the collaboration and reestablishing how stakeholders interact with each other from a security standpoint. Um, where and when and what do we scan is a big portion of it. So do we scan this artifact once, twice? Do we scan it once we, uh, you know, see it for the first time and then we scan it once our developer has gone through and added more of their application or custom specific code on top of that? Uh, you know, those are questions that you just constantly have to answer. Um, and then how do we protect very sensitive things? What uh, Secrets is a great example. Um, so how do we prevent secrets from being specified in a, in a Docker file? How do we detect that? How do we do um, secrets from leaking in other places, right? Other places in your CI pipeline. Um, so, uh, you know, that's just a, just a good example of protecting sensitive information, but this could also be, right, sensitive files or things like that. How do you prevent un, unauthorized disclosure of sensitive files and, and that build process, right? Um, and how do we make this flexible? So how do we make a pipeline that can handle all these challenges that, you know, can handle that won't compromise our, our security baseline that um, will leverage containerized technology and, and cloud native tooling? Uh, and, and how do we make it flexible enough to support uh, all the automation that needs to take place? So uh, you have all these different steps that need to take place as a part of our platform one pipeline. Uh, about 17 or so different jobs that we configured all in GitLab um, using eight, eight to 10 different security tools. Um, and you, the best part about this is that it's a plug and play model, right? So we're taking different security tools and responding to specific threats that we see out there. Um, and it's easy because we have a tool like GitLab that makes it easy to take that, take that pipeline and be able to put tools at different parts of that pipeline. So being able to drag and drop and put tools where they need to be very easily makes it uh, you know, very, very easy for us to go out and create a secure pipeline that kind of answers these three challenges. I'm now gonna hand it off to uh, James and he is going to discuss uh, some of the questions you should ask yourself when going about uh, building secure pipelines and answering these three challenges. Thanks, Hayden. So I want to get into some of the, the core things you need um, when, when selecting your tools um, to build your pipeline, when you're actually building your DevSecOps pipeline, and, and some of the best practices that um, we actually use, um, we implement every day, and we, we help implement at um, DoD Platform One. Um, so first, um, some of the questions to ask yourself when you're actually selecting your tools. Um, the, the first one being visibility. So, so what is it that's actually getting built into your container, into your production software? Um, there is an executive order that came out recently mandating um, an SBOM for any, any software that the government is going to use. And there's a reason for that. It, it provides deep insight into the software supply chain uh, that makes up that particular um, piece of software, that image, that container. Um, it tells you where, where your, what your dependencies are, where your dependencies are coming from, and who's actually making changes um, to that software at, at, you know, that you are using in your, in your production system. Um, the next is inspection. So, so what is it? So you, you've collected that information, you know, what's, what is, um, you know, all, everything that goes into this software, and now you need to actually inspect it. So checking for um, things such as, you know, what's changed between builds. Um, that's a very important one. What's actually, you know, changing inside your software is someone trying to sneak someone something in there, um, finding vulnerabilities or malware that might be hiding in your software. And then also looking for any sort of anomalous activity um, that's going on inside your software, whether that be one of the, the two previous topics. And then we go into policy enforcement. So, so should it be there? Um, so doing things, you know, perhaps some of the vulnerabilities that are there, it's okay because they, they don't really affect your software. You know, security has signed off on them. They're okay with that. Um, you know, those, those can be allowed through, um, because like I said, maybe it doesn't affect your software. And then also, um, you need to perhaps adhere to some sort of compliance standard, 
um, and, and encoding policy and doing so um, so that it's repeatable and it's enforceable um, is very important because, you know, humans make mistakes. But if you can actually encode that into an automated process, um, then it, it really increases your security um, because it's done so um, consistently. And then remediation. So how do I actually fix the issues that are surfaced through visibility, inspection, policy enforcement? Um, so what is, you know, your plan of action for fixing that vulnerability or, you know, making sure that that malware isn't there anymore? Um, things, you know, you need to make decisions like prioritizing which vulnerabilities need to be fixed first. So those are some important questions um, to ask as you move forward. Um, with designing your pipeline, um, you know, designing your whole security uh, infrastructure as you ship software. And some of the, the, the work that we've done at the DOD, um, we've learned quite a few lessons um, and, you know, we've, we've helped implement, we've learned um, some best practices and taken some of those lessons. So it's really essential to, to lay a strong foundation for software security. Um, there's many often overlooked practices that play a key role in creating security posture. Um, so some of those include, you know, sanitizing files for sensitive information, you know, using a tool like Trufflehog, something like that integrated with um, your GitLab environment um, to comb for secrets exposed in Git history and, you know, purging those secrets, making sure that they're not um, actually pushed into your Git history, um, things of that nature. And then implementing defense in depth. Um, so verifying software before building it into the container, um, building containers in a secure way. Uh, enforcing security and best practices for container post build, and then enforcing policy and controlling deployment of containers so nothing violates the, the security of what's deployed, and then enforcing security in the deployment environment, something like network policies surrounding ingress and egress. So have security checks and and you know you have security at each stage of the pipeline from dev to build um, to publish all the way to actually running software. And then verify input packages for, for your software builds. Um, so don't just install software from anywhere. Um, make sure it's signed. Make sure you can verify where it's coming from, what's in it. This goes back to the visibility. Uh, that's, you know, having an SBOM of, that's, that's why the government wants SBOMs for um, software that they're consuming because they want to actually see what's inside of there. And then embed your, your malware scanning. So make sure that you have um, malware scanning some, somewhere inside your DevSecOps pipeline um, and make sure it scans every software artifact um, that you're building and putting into your production software. And then encode your security controls through policy. Um, so do as much as possible to codify your security. Uh, don't rely on manual checks for consistent security because as humans, we can make mistakes. Um, there are things that can come up, um, you know, that maybe we don't recognize, um, but, you know, enforcing uh, policy um, through code, through automation, um, it, it really helps um, to, to enforce that security um, consistently. And it also allows security to scale. Um, so you can, um, you know, it's it's easy to do a manual review for, you know, 10 images or so. But once you scale up to thousands of images, you have to hire more people. You know, you have to get more people involved. One person can't handle all of that. So when you can codify it and build it into an automation system, you can actually apply security um, at scale. And then develop a plan of action for security findings. So this goes back to the remediation. So architect a process for handling security findings early. So will it involve mitigating the findings or just reporting the findings? You have to make those decisions on, on how you're actually going to handle the security, uh, especially once you get into production systems or, you know, deploying something like something to a Kubernetes cluster. You know, are you going to block poles of an image because it has new vulnerabilities in it? Well, you're going to take down production systems. You know, there, there are trade-offs that um, you, you have to discuss and make those decisions inside your your own organization. Um, and then when you continuously monitor the software, what is the plan of action? So that goes back to, you know, when you have a vulnerability found in production, um, 
that wasn't there at build time. Maybe it's a new vulnerability, something like that. Um, you know, what what are you going to do? Um, what is your plan for handling that? Um, you know, are you going to ideally, you know, fix it in dev, push it all the way to um, prod um, as quickly as possible? But you know, what what is that process? What does that look like? And then use flexible tool sets. So tools like Anchor and GitLab, they have full API coverage, um, which as a practitioner, I can tell you is really awesome. Um, so they're very flexible to, to integrate into your workflow. Um, so you can in, interact with them um, however you need, you know, whether it's Jenkins, GitLab, CI, whether you, know, you are just running bash scripts on a VM, you know, there's interacting with GitLab um, and with Anchor, you know, it's, it's easy. Um, and then it, it, it also gives um, practitioners, um, someone like myself, somewhere to start without having to um, build from scratch. And then adhere to industry standards. Um, industry standards, they're there for a reason. Uh, it's a conglomeration of best practices from very knowledgeable people. You know, there, there are things that are proven to have worked um, in the industry. There's a reason that they're there. So doing things like um, you know, security scanning, linting your Docker files, um, your infrastructure as code, your cube manifests, um, those are all very important. So next, I really want to talk about, um, you know, our case study. So platform one, DevSecOps in real life, they're, they're actually doing it. So they, they have built um, a pipeline to um, secure uh, containers, and then they publish the the Iron Bank Registry One, um, which is a um, registry of, of hardened containers. Um, so how do they do it? How, what does it look like? Well, for Platform One, um, they, they start with untrusted software um, that is brought in. It's typically rebased on top of a Red Hat Ubi image. Um, they have distro lists, they have Scratch if your application um, uses one of those base images, but typically it's built on top of a Red Hat Ubi image because that is the approved base container. So that has gone through hard, the hardening process um, and it's been approved. And so therefore um, the security, you know, it's that defense in depth. Base container has been secured. So now you can um, build things on top of it. But anyways, so um, everything starts off uh, rebase on top of Red Hat Ubi image. Um, then you download all the dependencies in the pipeline and you do the verification. So you check the signatures, um, you, you scan them for malware, um, make sure you don't build anything into your container that you're not expecting to be there. Um, once they've all been verified, um, everything is passed into a build job that's actually built on a, a disconnected um, build node. So it's a disconnected GitLab runner. Um, that we use. We use the Kubernetes um, executor and, and um, have some network policy around our, our um, build node or our build pod um, for um, our GitLab runner. And so it'll build that software or that container offline so it doesn't do anything like reach out, download something during build time, which is a big no-no. Um, and, and that's really you know, that, that enforces um, that the, the software that you downloaded previously, all your dependencies um, are actually what's built into the container and there's nothing that you're uh, not expecting in there. And then once it's been built, it's scanned by multiple security scanners. So it's scanned by OpenSCAP, um, Twistlock, and then ourselves, Anchor. Um, the CVE results from all of the scanners and the policy evaluation from Anchor um, they're all put into a centralized database where um, the findings, they, they go through a review process. Um, so security engineers will actually go in, they'll take a look at the findings, they, they see um, you know, whether that CVE or this finding actually affects the container. Um, and then they will go ahead and go you know, mitigate it or um, what they call justify it. Um, so this, if it's justified, this, you know, this vulnerability, maybe like I was saying previously, it doesn't actually affect this software. So it's okay to be there. Maybe it's a false positive, something like that. Um, and then after that, after the security investigation is done, um, it's it's all collected, all of the information. So the SBOM, um, all, of the, all of the findings, all of the justifications, they're all collected together and they're sent up to an approval authority who, who signs off on each justification 
um, and reviews the contents of the container. Um, this is where, you know, justifications, maybe they're sent back and said, you know, okay, this, this needs more justification or this actually needs to be mitigated because, you know, you are actually vulnerable, things like that. Um, but once um, all of that has been remediated, the, the authorizing uh, official actually approves the container. Um, it goes and it lands in um, the Iron Bank public registry where it's consumable by anyone. Um, so it's public on the internet. So it's, it's consumable by developers, by production systems, um, anyone who wants to go out and, and consume a hardened container. Um, so our elements to a strong security foundation, um, which Platform One really has, um, it starts off with with the culture. Um, so you know, having security training for everyone. I know you know some people get annoyed by it, but it is actually important. It's very useful, and having ownership. Um, you know, who owns the security for this? Well, everyone owns it, but you know, who is in charge of making sure that um, there are no no holes in this piece? Um, no holes in that piece. And then, like I said, um, really using API first tools. Um, so pick and choose tools that are easy to use, preferably, preferably something that has full API coverage. Um, and, and that way, integrating with the tool is easy. It's easy for um, your practitioners. It's easy to use. It's easy to modify your system. Um, you're not stuck in this rigid system um, that only works one way and you can't change it, you can't evolve it um, over time. And I like to say, nobody wants to maintain spaghetti infrastructure. So we've heard of spaghetti code. Same can happen with infrastructure, especially as you're, you're connecting tools together. Um, so really having flexible tools that are easy to use, it's, it's very important. And then staying policy centric. Um, so we know fail fast is a thing for dev. Um, so, you know, if your build's gonna fail, you want it to fail early in the pipeline or some check is gonna fail, you want it to fail early so you're not waiting for 10, 15 minutes um, before um, you actually know that your stuff failed and you need to fix it. Um, so same thing goes for security. Um, so start to encode security early in your pipeline and you know sometimes like runtime checks they're not you can't do those necessarily early in a pipeline um, but there are pieces of those checks that maybe could happen um, at at the build time um, you know at the source code time that things that um, you know it, i guess just focus on moving security um, to the left and and failing fast when you know that something is in clear violation of security and then you want to lower your efforts um, to actually fix those vulnerabilities, um, remediate containers, things like that. So really take advantage of automation. And then finally, um, you want to continuously monitor um, all of your production software. Um, so security, it's not just one and done. Uh, it's a continuous process. Um, so you want to monitor your production software for not only breaches, you know, someone trying to hack into your software um, or your system that you're running, um, but also monitor it for things like new vulnerabilities um, and then have a plan of action. Like I was talking about, when you do find a new vulnerability in production, um, what is your plan of action for remediating that? Um, you know, is it fix it, build it, push it all the way through to production and deploy it? Is it, you know, take down the software or something, something of that nature, um, but just discuss it within your own organization. You know, if we do see this, what, what is our plan of action and, and come to an agreement with everyone. Thanks for coming to our talk at Commit. Um, it was a pleasure speaking with you. Um, like Hayden said, uh, we have our supply chain security survey. Um, please check it out. It's, it's some pretty cool data. Um, also, if you want to try out Anchor, um, we actually have an integration with GitLab. So if you're a current GitLab user, which I'm sure most of you are, um, it's, it's pretty easy to get up and running with an Anchor scan. Um, you can check it out. You can also check us out um, on our website. And if you wanna check out Platform One, I included uh, the website there. It's a, it's a pretty cool um, organization um, put on by the Air Force. Um, definitely worth uh, giving it a go. So with that, thank you um, and everyone have a great day.